Hi, so uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's always it's a pleasure to uh, to speak. And uh, in the meantime, of course, I'm learning about a lot of new things for me. So uh, I'm enjoying also the other talks very much. I'll talk about an uh, experiment that we did. And um, let me start with uh, something that lots of you, everybody has probably seen, right? In the Feynman Lectures of Physics, you have this uh, this wonderful picture of an electron source, a double slit, and of course probability is measured when one slit is closed and then of course when both are open. And he of course has these, these very well-known quotes that it's, uh, in reality it contains the only mystery. Um, at some point an uh, undergraduate student, Roger Buck, contacted me and said he wanted to do some research in my lab and he wanted to see the double slit electron diffraction experiment. So I decided, okay, great, let's do it. I wanted to see it myself too. It's actually interesting. And uh, we then, after doing something like that, we uploaded a movie to YouTube and the uh, outreach manager from the Perimeter Institute he, Damien Pope, contacted us and wanted to shoot an educational movie, which they did at the time. So they came over and it's uh, nice things with actors and, you know, Stephen Hawking has a little comment and it has been used by many high schools right now. So that's the reason why we did this. So it's not uh, part of our main research program. It's more outreach and education. Um, so this image we took, so one, we closed one image and we closed the other one. You got this one. We opened both. You got this one. What we also did is we took little movies, so we added, you know, we changed the image, right? Not only did we do two, these two images, we added a mask here, adding to um, Feynman's, what is it, um, picture. And if you move that mask, so here is a mask, and underneath the double slit, and one opens, then you see a beam emerging on a two-dimensional detector, so you're looking into the beam coming towards you. As soon as the second slit opens, you see a diffraction pattern emerging, and as soon as then the other slit closes, then of course the diffraction pattern nicely disappears. So we're doing this, and it's kind of nice to do it. The other thing that you can do is record again the electrons one electron at a time, and you should pay attention. Here was the first one. I'm going to point that out. It's a little hard to see, but more will come in. This was done at a rate of one electron per second. The machine is a meter long. The electrons move at 10 to the 7 meters per second, so it takes about 10 minus 7 seconds for them to fly through there. And of course, we have to wait for a while, but it, we keep on recording, of course, here. Then we, I will speed up the display, but all of them took several hours to take. So it's, it's done that way. And then you see, of course, after a while that your interference pattern appears. And of course, this was done for that particular outreach movie. And it's hopefully a nice movie. You can download this in from New Journal of Physics. It's a, a additional material, so if you want to use it, it's just readily available. So the next thing, it's nice to keep one of Feynman's quote there. We should show right away that you should not try to set up this experiment. This experiment has never been done in just this way. The trouble is the apparatus have to be made in an possibly small scale to show the effects we're interested in. That might have been true at those time, but with the help of Xi Wang Liu from our condensed matter physics group, you use uh, ion mills to make all this stuff. So it, it plays out at about 50 nanometer or 100 nanometer scale, and you just can do it nowadays. It's not that hard anymore. Um, I should also mention, of course, if you look at Wikipedia, you see this pattern. So everybody probably knows that, the kind of double slit experiment, that is how it referred to. Uh, Tonomora, what he actually did, of course, took a field emission tip with a biprism wire where the electron wave front split in two. You put a positive charge in this, and so you make really a biprism interferometer and then record it. So he did actually not make a double slit like was done here by my grad student, Roger Buck. So, and of course, you know, Tonna Moore, of course, did inspire this because his idea is to, to record this one electron at a time is really a remarkable achievement, right? And we just took one step to, for the purpose of explaining this to high school students, the complication of having a biprism wire and explaining this is actually not something that the outreach manager wanted. They wanted an actual clean double slit with this experiment is, right? And I was fortunate enough to write a paper also with Tonna Morris. So I, he was actually very uh, encouraging about doing an experiment, an actual double slit. All right, good. So, so much about that one. And it's interesting though, if I, sometimes I give talks about this stuff. And remember, this is where the first electron 
landed. So suppose I stop the experiment after that first electron, and I can do so because it comes about in one electron per second, so even manually you can sit there and wait for one that lands there and switch it off and record it. It's kind of fun to do. Um, if you do that, then I always like to ask my students the question, is uh, momentum conserved? So if you do this, this is your momentum before, this is your momentum after, you have one particle detected, and they say, what's going on here? And, uh, well, yeah, of course, most people think that the grating uh, suffers a recoil, and uh, you have momentum conservation. Is that indeed what, what happens? Well, of course, Einstein wanted to use that in this famous einstein bohr debate to actually figure out which way the particle went, right? We all know this, that if the particle went to the top slit, there was a recoil here, if you measure it, then without disturbing, right, you would know what is going on and still have interference, or the other way around could happen too. And of course, Bohr replied that you have an uncertainty on the position of the first slit, so if you try to do this with enough accuracy on your momentum, you cannot do it, you cannot figure out where his weights go, right? We all know that. Um, of course, Bohr did not uh, retort that the slit and the particle did not exchange momentum. They do both say that you exchange momentum. And of course, Wooders and Zurich analyzed this, how much knowledge can you have and still have contrast. Also, they assume that you exchange momentum. So then I always ask the question, what interaction caused the momentum exchange between the electronic grating, since everybody agrees that you do exchange momentum? And it's funny, because if I give talks about this, in a different context, in physics colloquia, then these are the answers I get from professors in the audience, and I have a ha habit to writing them down, which I think I get great joy out of. So some say electrons reflect from the bar edges. Some say phonons are excited in the grating. Uh, and I'm allowed to say who that was. That was actually Manfred Fink at Texas Austin, because he doesn't mind if I tell people. Uh, three is vacuum field photons scatter electrons in the grating and poses boundary condition in that field. Uh, the electron fields acts on the grating with backs an electron. This is not a question one should ask, right? Or I calculated this but never published it. It's also a serious professor who said that. Gave a talk at Harvard when this was stated. Um, what about neutrons or photons was a student comment, so whatever you come up with. So I thought this is interesting, and the statistics is something that 50% says about the question one should not ask, and about 50% actually attempts to answer this question, which I find amusing. I have no opinion on this stuff. Um, and of course, you understand this position, right? No one has ever come up with a mechanism to explain double slit diffraction that might motivate this. But nevertheless, of course, this slit and the particle exchange momentum. Now, we did another experiment and I will ask the same question about it. This was 2001, already a while ago, where we took a uh, standing wave of light. So light comes from the left and from the right. We collimated uh, electron beams with slits, and we look at this effect. And that was this kapitza dirac effect, and we followed uh, the atomic version done by Dave Pritchett at MIT, but electrons had never been done. You needed 10 or 8 orders of magnitude more light, and you need to do pulse and coincident techniques. So experimentally, it's pretty interesting, but... Um, so we did this, and then here you have, of course, a wave in this area, and the electron interf uh, interacts with that grating of light. Now, the experiment goes something like this. There it is. It's just a tabletop experiment. You fire a laser pulse. You have a coherence length of a couple of millimeters, so you form a standing wave. Electrons run down the tube, and you record here where these electrons land. Right, that's what you do. So then what you see is this. This is the beam without a laser. And this is the beam with the laser, and the black line is just a simulation done solving the Schrodinger equation. So again, quantum mechanics works beautifully and nice, as it usually does. And um, that's nice. So, and Dan Freeman was the one who did the experiment. And of course, you could ask, what interaction caused the momentum exchange between the electron and the grating? Now, in this case, if you write on this, so you write a review of modern physics later on, a couple of years later, and you ask the question, then this is the answer, right? So stimulated Compton scattering. That means, let me run this again, goes a little quick. Yeah. Ah. Let's see, can I go back? There we go. So the electron comes in, it absorbs a photon from the right, right? And it stimulates one from the left, and it gets a kick over to H bar K, and of course this gives exactly the usual diffraction angle. And that's well known also for the atomic case, this works beautifully, so indeed, here it's okay, apparently, to ask the question. So usually when people say, ah, oh, this is not a question you should ask, I give this reply and say, hey, a 
come on, we should be able to ask questions for, that describe all experiments in the same way, right? I hope. Um, so I go back to the double slit and say, hey, my electron landed there. What caused the interaction? Good, I don't know, I'm not gonna answer it, but I wanna move over to this possibility. It, effectively, what I'd like to do, I would like to you know, come up with an answer and with experimental techniques to rule out answers or you know, confirm it. That's one of the things I would love to do. So let's look at this vacuum field stuff. Can that do it? Um, is it maybe a vacuum field effect where you have indeed some double slits, you have a vacuum field that, that, that you know, puts a boundary condition and the electron interacts in some way with that vacuum field and tells it where to go. Well, then I found in 2014 in this book by De La Peña and Chetto, and Chetto is an audience here, I found this, this interesting picture where here at the top is a double slit and here are trajectories for electrons uh, being modified by an electromagnetic vacuum field and apparently that is capable to some extent to explain uh, bundles of trajectories. There's no picture there of an actual uh, distribution, so maybe they're still part of a work in progress, presumably. And uh, yeah, I started to try to understand what's going on there because this is this theory of stochastic electrodynamics, which is uh, interesting, and I wanted to see what it can do and what it cannot do. So we did a a simple system. We took a toy system, a mass on a spring, and we bathed in a vacuum field. And then you have, you know, equations that you can solve analytically. And there was a prediction that you get nice the ground state, but I wanted to see what the trajectory was, so we did it numerically, so it becomes maybe a little bit visible. So something like this, right? A classical mechanical system, the particle moves back and forth as a function of time, moves back and forth, and this is your probability distribution, which we all know. Maxima, the turning points. And in this case, you get a quantum mechanical distribution or a stochastic or random electrodynamic distribution, which is the same as the quantum mechanical one, proven analytically in the 70s already. But what does the trajectory look like? Well, here's a trajectory. So this is a trajectory of an electron exposed to, to many vacuum modes, 100,000 or so that we need for this system to converge numerically. And then the dotted lines are the numerical results and the red lines are the quantum mechanical results. So it's kind of neat that indeed this, this a particle can there just shake back and forth in the vacuum field and give the quantum ground state. It's amusing. You have kind of a balance between absorption of energy from the vacuum field and re-radiation out of it because it's accelerating all the time. That's what happens in this theory. Um, now, I also wanted to say, well, okay, this theory to me was an uh, approximation. I want to explore the validity range. And thus, because I, di I did not... Uh, I, want to go along with the idea that it would do the same thing as quantum mechanics. So I just wanted to have a counter argument and say, okay, here it must be false. Uh, and so I said, oh, you know what? If I take this harmonic oscillator, right? If I take this harmonic oscillator and put a pulse, an excitation pulse there, I probably don't get excited or things that look like excited states. That's, that's what I wanted to see. Well, we did this. So we did a uh, classical system. We give an excitation pulse. You have no energy, and when the excitation pulse frequency is changing, you hit resonance, then you excite the system and nowhere else. If you do it with fully quantum mechanics, then you have the blue dotted line, you get a peak here, and of course you get your excitation to higher excited states. If you do it with uh, stochastic electrodynamics, so you have this classical harmonic oscillator in a vacuum field and you give it an excitation pulse, classical excitation pulse, then you get this excitation spectrum. So you are in the ground state as we expected because that was already shown analytically before and we showed what type of trajectories you have. But as soon as you give the excitation pulse, you get a nice resonance excitation, but also your first overtone and your second overtone, and you find quite good agreement, which at the time I said, what, this is crazy, this is quantization somehow coming out? Well, I I'm, I'm, don't think that's what it is. It's kind of a parametric uh, excitation of a system. It's a classical phenomenon, and that's totally fine. It can happen this way. So anyway, uh, but at that time, at least, I, we were capable of, of fi figuring out something about which vacuum modes you need for this toy system. And for, of course, double slit diffraction, and we're trying to move on, and not there yet, uh, to figure out how in that system you should describe vacuum field modes an electron can interact with. So to test, at least, uh, can maybe double slit diffraction be explained by interacting with a vacuum field. 
Or is that a way to think about it? Right? Maybe it's not an explanation. Maybe it's just a way to think about it. So you can do more. This is not, the other stuff is published. This is not published. So just, we were, uh, Wayne Huang, the grad student who worked with me, uh, was playing with this. And um, we've also found that you can do coherent states. So here's a quantum mechanical simulation of a coherent state. Here is the uh, phase space picture. And there is the, the other picture. This is the stochastic electrodynamics picture. It works quite nicely. And then you can do squeezed vacuum states. Uh, this is just, we didn't do any real quantitative measure. This is just at the level of qualitative agreement, so you can do that type of stuff. Uh, you can do, you know, a uh, with third order excitation, you can make even, you know, some other behavior that is quite similar. So all these things apparently fairly map onto each other. And I, of course, when I teach quantum mechanics for grad students, then I've often said, oh, these are really very quantum mechanical states. And I, I maybe have to take my, uh, claims back, yes. Okay, good. It's two minutes, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. And um, here's another uh, maybe vacuum field effect. So what I want to do is look at the grading, uh, change maybe the codings, change the, vac the vacuum field in the vicinity, and see if then the teacher diffraction pattern changes. Even if it's completely consistent with what quantum mechanics will give us, maybe it gives you a way to think about it. That does mean experimentally you need to figure out what do structures do in the vicinity electron beam. Here we measure decoherence as a function of distance following Hasselbach's work, and we rule out Zurek's theory of dissi classical dissipation, which is nice, and we agree with Hasselbach's data. Um, there's another one where we have measured the image charge. So we can measure the image of an electron with a little grading bar. So we're trying to sort out all the possible other effects that you might have before you can do an experiment and look at the vacuum field effects. And um, so I'm going to just skip to the end because then there are questions. Let me thank Roger Buck for the double slit experiments, Wayne and Wang for the simulation, RAD, and Peter for the decoherence experiments and all the discussions we'll have with other people. That's it.